Hello everybody and welcome to the Dry Dock episode 273. This week the questions are taken from guides 338 and 339, that's on the Regia Marina's Aquila carrier and the Russian battleship that according to a number of the comments is not pronounced Tri Svetatelia but something more along the lines of Tri Svetatelia or Svetatelia. Sviatitelia? Maybe? I don't know. Sorry. I don't speak Russian. Anyway, Wednesday videos, finding the wreck of HMS Captain and USS Texas in dry dock going inside the ship, and a guest question or two from preserving the past, how to digitize old books without a full suite of resources. Brendan Boersdorf asks, do you have any information on the design specs for the Japanese Ibuki class carrier conversion? I've seen many conflicting sources on how many aircraft it could carry, how much armament it would have, etc, etc. So collating what I would classify as the most reliable sources, that being La Croix and Wells, Japanese Cruisers of the Pacific War, and a couple of Japanese volumes, um, wonderfully entitled the history of i think it's history of japanese aircraft carriers is roughly how it translates uh, or japanese aircraft carrier story perhaps but anyway when it comes to the aircraft and armament of the converted ibuki the more that well those sources combined and the more reliable other sources out there basically come down to when in the design process they're taking their specifications from because what seems to have happened is that initially when the ships well the ships were originally planned to be converted they were just converting the the they ended up just converting the original ship ibuki they were planning on having an air group of 30 aircraft so it would have been 15 a7M fighters, that's uh, in Japanese the Repu fighter, allied code name Sam, and 15 B7A Ryusei or Grace uh, strike aircraft. So they could do dive or torpedo bomber attacks, much like the Fulmar, the Sky Raider, the Avenger later in life, etc. So if you see a citation that says the, it could carry 30 aircraft, then it's from the initial design spec. They later revised that down to only taking 12 of the B7A strike aircraft because a lot of these aircraft were going to have to be carried on deck. And so if you see a citation that says 27 aircraft in the flight group, then that's from the final design spec or as final as it got. As you can see from this picture, the ship was never completed and given how many design revisions it underwent while it was being converted, who knows, they might have changed the air group again. If you see anything that's different from 27 or 30, then it's not from the original design specs and is probably, if we're being charitable, maybe guesswork based on theoretical total air capacity using an air group other than the officially planned one. So, you know, maybe someone's taken the total hangar deck storage and the air of the flight deck they're planning using the storage and used a zero, for example. Said, oh, well, if they could have an all zero uh, group, then they could carry this many aircraft, which would be higher because the zero is considerably smaller than the A7M or the B7A, for example. And likewise with the anti-aircraft armament, Ironically, much like the Cleveland class conversions into the Independence class, the Ibukis were originally supposed to just have a bunch of triple 25mm anti-aircraft guns to give you know notice to the crew that they were under air attack, not that they do a tremendous amount else. But later on in the design spec, so again, if you see purely on with 25 bills, someone's taken the first level design spec and sourced that. But later on, they were planning on putting some three-inch anti-aircraft guns in. 
So if you see citation for that or citation for the multiple anti-aircraft rocket launch systems that look a lot like the early War Royal Navy unrotated projectile launchers, then that is from the later design spec. R. De Boer asks, was suspending aircraft from a carrier's hangar ceiling common practice amongst other navies, and was the idea ever utilised to its full potential? So apart from the US Navy, where obviously this was common practice initially, as you can see in the picture, when you get to the other navies, there are only really two major carrier operating navies outside of the US, the Royal Navy and the Japanese Navy. Okay, you've got Bayern, but yeah, whatever. Um, <laughs> now, in the other navies, it was not common practice to hang aircraft from the ceiling. And in fact, even in the US Navy, it varied a little bit depending on the carrier in question. And that's simply because when you look at the early carrier conversions, so for the Royal Navy, Glorious, Furious and Courageous, and for the Japanese, Akagi and Kaga, and for the Americans, Lexington and Saratoga, the British ships are using considerably smaller hulls to start with. The Japanese have a somewhat smaller hole in Kaga, and even a Kagi isn't actually as long as the Lexington's by about 30 feet. And on top of that, both the British and the Japanese go for a multiple hangar setup. And in fact, this is a setup that, outside of design restrictions, both the Japanese and the British tend to continue with for quite a period during the interwar time. So Unicorn, Ark Royal, they have double hangers. Indomitable has a sort of hanger and a half, as do the Implacables. And with the other three Illustriouses, they've got the restriction of relatively small size dictated by the displacement limits of the treaty and the weight of the armoured flight deck. And, you know, Hiryu and Soryu were relatively small the Shigakus go for double height hangers, you know, and, and essentially what everybody else is doing is saying, well, if we have double hangers, and with the Shigakus, I should have double hangers, um, i.e. two hanger deck levels, then that, if you had them exactly the same size, would double the hanger floor area. And even if you have a partial length second hangar deck, the lower hangar deck, it's still going to give you quite a lot of hangar deck floor space, which can allow you to store a lot of aircraft. Okay, great, fantastic. But in order to do that without having a ship that's stupidly tall, and Unicorn and Ark Royal, for example, were already tall enough that their flight decks, if they were still around, would be taller, um, their up flight deck would be higher above the waterline than the flight decks on a modern Nimitz or Ford class supercarrier. Um, but, you know, to stop it getting truly silly and the aircraft carrier just tipping over, you had to limit the height of the hangar deck. And at the time that these aircraft carriers were being designed, that was entirely reasonable. I mean, aircraft came at a certain height. You could design in a small additional factor for the latest and greatest aircraft and potentially even maybe the next gen beyond that. But why would you go any higher? You know, if you've if you've got an aircraft hangar height that is the correct height for the aircraft that you have at the moment and you think you're going to have in service going forward, then it makes more sense to expand your hangar deck space because that means you can carry more aircraft and aircraft that can actually be utilised. Because, of course, the aircraft like this that are strung up in the ceilings, you'll notice they've got major parts of their wings removed. So if you need to marshal a deck strike, you aren't going to be using these aircraft. These aircraft are spares, replacements for aircraft that might be too damaged in combat. But when it came to Lexington and Saratoga in particular, the US was blessed with having the largest hulls to convert, and because the US was much happier with deck parking than everybody else, the fact that they had a pretty substantial hangar, because they went, you know, near enough full-length hangar on Lexington and Saratoga right from the get-go, whereas obviously you look at Akagi, Kaga, 
Glorious Viewers, Courageous, etc. They have those multi-stepped back flight decks to start with, which also have a secondary effect of limiting the length of the hangar. So put those two together, the Americans have got quite a lot of hangar deck space already just with a single big hangar. And they've got, because they've got such large hulls, they can have that single hangar deck be relatively tall because you know they're not having to squeeze in two sets of hangar decks. And that has this neat little effect that means you can store aircraft above to a certain degree. As I said, Lexington and Saratoga, their hangar decks are 20 foot high. They can easily do it. When you look at the Yorktowns, etc., 17 and a half foot high, plus aircraft are becoming larger and larger, it becomes a little more difficult. They can do it with some aircraft, especially early on, but when you look at interior shots in World War II of various Yorktown and Essex class carriers, you'll actually notice there are very, very few shots that are like the one that you can see here, which is taken on a Lexington class. Because that two and a half foot drop in hangar height combined with the larger aircraft makes storage in the ceiling considerably more difficult. And then that large hangar height comes into play not so much because of your ability to carry spare aircraft, or as I say, it could be done. It comes into play more so because it allows you to operate larger aircraft as aircraft get bigger and bigger and bigger, as they tend to do, whereas... For example, with the Royal Navy, they had problems operating the Corsair. And it also means that when it comes to the post-war environment, these aircraft carriers are considerably more useful because, again, 17 and a half foot high, they can operate a good number of first and second generation jet aircraft, whereas, again, the lower hangar heights, which were perfectly fine for most World War II aircraft in, say, Royal Navy carriers, just can't accommodate any real significant growth beyond that. And there are also a few limits to this kind of idea. I mean, obviously, suspended aircraft are very vulnerable if somebody bombs the flight deck, even if it was theoretically armoured. You know, the nearby shock will probably be enough to damage them. But more to the point, you only want to carry so many spare aircraft because when you send aircraft out, the number of aircraft that you're going to get back that are either damaged beyond repair but have the pilots etc still alive or damaged can be repaired but it's going to take an awful lot of time i.e that margin where bringing out the spare aircraft is useful that's got hopefully going to be a relatively small number of the overall aircraft because some are going to be lost most hopefully going to come back intact and some are going to come back damaged but repairable so it's only that kind of damaged beyond practicable immediate repair set that you're going to want to replace otherwise you will need lots and lots of extra pilots and if you're storing lots and lots of extra pilots and lots and lots of extra aircraft that's an awful lot of essentially dead weight that you're not going to be using unless and until you start suffering significant casualties because of course if you start replacing lost aircraft with a aircraft shot down over the enemy with aircraft from your ceiling you also need replacement pilots and it all adds up jbpa asks can you explain why turret turret balancing is important and how it works yes so the turret of a ship i mean originally there was a central spindle which made things a lot easier to calculate but in most 20th century gun turrets or fully armored barbettes to be more accurate you have a theoretical center of mass and i say theoretical not because it doesn't exist but theoretical because there's no physical object down the middle to say you know the center of mass will be here as opposed to as i said at the earlier turrets where there would be a central spindle and the problem with turret balancing is that obviously you want the most armor on your turret to be on the turret face because that hopefully is going to be the bit that's pointing towards the enemy Plus, you have these really long guns that are sticking out of there. So if you look at the center of the turret, and if a turret is mounted on the center line, you can kind of see on this diagram that line going down the middle there. You want your turret to balance down that point for two primary reasons. Firstly, ships move, especially they roll. And if your turret is unbalanced, then as the ship rolls, one end of it, i.e. the 
business end with the guns and the heavy plate armor is going to want to move that way around its axis of rotation, which is going to put a huge amount of strain on any braking mechanism that you've put on. And if that breaks or isn't sufficient, etc., or you just don't have one, you're just relying on the turret's mass, then when your ship rolls, the turret's going to go that way, which firstly is going to be a little bit dangerous for anyone trying to get into or out of the turret or anyone who doesn't want to be clocked in the head by a large caliber naval gun swinging around. But it is also going to be a danger to your ship because now you've got an offset weight that could be several hundred tons or possibly several thousand tons if you're talking about something like a Yamato, all off to the side of your ship's already rolling, which could completely destabilize your ship and cause you to flip over in particularly bad weather conditions. But also, if your turret is unbalanced, then that means as your turret rotates on its bearings, the front of the turret is going to want to dig in more. It's going to have a lot more friction, which is going to cause uneven wear on your bearings, which very quickly can disrupt your turret's ability to turn properly. And that's just when you're regularly at sea. If you're in battle, you know, if let's say you've got your turrets pointing towards the enemy and then a particularly heavy wave hits and your turrets now go and spin around and go pointing the other way. That in and of itself is pretty bad. Plus also, if you have a habit of keeping your turrets in the stored position fore and aft, you're going to have wear and potentially, even if you're really unlucky, um, mass welding or however you describe it, depending on your country, basically where bits of metal can actually partially fused together just based on the fact they're being pressed together really hard for extended periods of time you might not be able to turn your turrets um, or the wear pattern might make it very difficult for you to turn your turret past a certain amount if you've been training them within a certain area now fortunately there are some relatively easy ways of making sure that that doesn't happen as you can see looking down the middle balancing your turret left to right port to starboard is usually quite easy because everything tends to be fairly symmetrical. The big problem is that fore to aft because you've got you know the guns and the weight of the frontal plate armor forward. And the way you can do that is usually one of two things. I mean, there's there's small things you can do like adjusting the position of the guns to make them a bit closer to the center line, but whatever. The two things you usually see are either you just put a big weight on the back if you don't want your turret to become particularly long so your turret back plate might actually be much thicker than it necessarily needs to be for the for reasons of combat or other weights may be added to the back you know range finders etc etc where you've got a choice where in the gun house do you put things you might just start sticking heavy at the heavier weighted objects towards the back of the turret to provide an amount of counterbalance and obviously you can calculate all of this and the other thing you might do which is for the same reason why you'd be putting all the weight as far back on the turret as possible because you obviously want to use the law of moments to generate the most counterbalancing force for the least amount of weight expended the other thing you can do is just make the turret back longer so if you look at a lot of turrets and this goes for a lot of cruiser turrets as well as battleship turrets you might notice that the frontal armor plate comes to a stop almost exactly on or very close to the barbette. So it extends the minimum amount possible past the, the barbette at that end. Whereas you go around the back, you might notice the back of the turret actually extends you know, several feet past the barbette. And that's not just to create space, that's also to help create the balance without having to artificially add weight that you don't necessarily need because of course thanks to the law of moments if you have a barbette diameter of 30 feet i.e the radius is 15 feet then if you have your mass front i.e your frontal armor plate and guns etc exerting their force up to the point of the barbette and this is extremely crude because this isn't actually where those forces would be exerted. The armor plate force, if you have a slab-faced turret, might be right at that 15-foot marker. But obviously, the guns are going to exert their force where they're mounted, which might be closer in. But for simplicity's sake, 
let's say those collective forces are exerted at a 15 foot distance from your center and if the back of your turret extends another let's say five feet past the barbette then the forces on that side are going to be exerting their well at the very back let's say the, the back armor plate that's exerting its force 20 feet away and because a turning moment is force multiplied by distance that means you need less force i.e less weight on the back of the turret compared to the front of the turret to create an equal balancing moment and precisely for this reason amongst others is why a lot of the time if you look at the full schematic of gun turrets you'll actually the guns are quite far back in the turret which can be a little bit of a design compromise because the further back in the turret it goes and therefore the further back the center of rotation for the gun's elevation is the more of a hole you need to cut in the front turret face to allow the gun to elevate to an appropriate height if the gun's mounted a lot closer to the front of the turret then you need a smaller opening but it would also increase the amount of the turning moment that you would be generating in your overall turret balance and therefore it's actually better and easier to balance the turret if the guns are set further back so you know turret design is quite a compromise scott mason asks why were the turks allowed to keep the gerben when the first world war ended well she was less important as a prize compared to a lot of other ships because well firstly she was a little bit obsolete she was an 11 inch armed battle cruiser compared to the Der Flingers, well, Der Flinger in Hindenburg, and various battleships, she was a lower priority vessel. And also, to be honest, at the end of World War I, she was not in the best condition. It would probably be take more than it you'd get in scrap value to actually take her from the Ottomans and haul her out through the Bosphorus, the Dardanelles, and into the Mediterranean and to wherever it was it was going to be broken up. So that's the practical side of things. The political side of things is also that in the immediate aftermath of World War I, the Ottoman Empire collapsed and new government took over. So the Ottoman Empire, well, the main bit of it, the bit that historically has been called Asia Minor, now came to be called Turkey. And the new government argued two main things. One, that they were a completely brand new political organization uh, that had nothing to do in terms of the political sins of the previous government and therefore they should not be liable for that which included things like whether or not they should give up the Gerben or Yavut Sultan Selim as it was by that point and more prosaically in the middle of the revolution that they'd undertaken to take power uh, they'd also kicked out most of the former if you look at World War One, former allied contingents that had been in the Ottoman Empire. So it was also a sort of a case of finders keepers if you want it, come and take it. And combine that with the aforementioned uh, issues with the fact that Gerben was neither in good condition nor particularly modern at that stage. No one could really be bothered to go through all the effort of antagonizing a new country. And so they were just allowed to have it hang around. John Doe asks, the main turrets on the Russian pre-dreadnought appear to be standalone. Was there a reason beyond aesthetics that they weren't inside or enveloped by the superstructure like the broadside casements? Yeah, there are two reasons, one much larger than the other. The much larger reason is field of fire. Now you can see from this diagram that the superstructure actually chamfers back from the turrets at both ends and you'll see this is pretty common right from the start of turreted ships like um, devastation all the way forward into world war ii design ships and that's simply to allow the turrets the greatest arc of fire possible because of course you might theoretically plan on a broadside engagement but just because you might be fighting in a line of battle doesn't strictly mean your enemy has to be 90 degree perpendicular to you at which point, if they're slightly ahead or slightly behind you, you need your guns to be able to rotate slightly past that perpendicular point. And so you can see with uh, this particular vessel and with many others, that chamfering or angling goes on to allow the guns to fire, essentially the aft gun to fire 
somewhat forward and the forward gun to fire somewhat aft. And if the gun turret is completely enveloped or partially enveloped by superstructure, they won't be able to do that either at all or without causing massive disruption to the superstructure thanks to gun blast. That's the primary reason. The secondary reason is that if you did advance this, so let's say for whatever reason you decided we, we, we want to preserve the theoretical arc of fire, but we're going to maybe have a, a steeper chamfer, so the corner point where it meets the outer portion of the hull is going to remain where it is, but we're maybe going to draw these lines in so they meet at, say, if we're looking at it, the, the aft turret at the two o'clock and four o'clock position relative to our point of view, that could have a rather major problem because in battle, if the ship takes a hit, obviously this superstructure is not armoured. And whilst the shell that hits and blows up a section of the superstructure might not be enough to penetrate the main armour of the turret, it might be enough to chew up and twist and move around the superstructure that's right on top of it enough to jam the turret's capability to move, which of course is quite bad if you're trying to move the turrets to shoot at your enemy. So big primary reason, secondary damage reason, damage control reason, this is why turrets are independent of the superstructure in almost all vessels with significant sized guns in turrets. Brendan Boersdorf asks, what was the reason for the construction of the pre-dreadnought HMS Hood? It seems like at the time the British are making large classes of pre-dreadnoughts and yet out of nowhere there's this one-off ship. Why? You can blame the first Sea Lord for this one. Up until the Royal Sovereign class, a considerable portion of the Royal Navy's turreted ironclads, because bear in mind, even by the Royal Sovereigns, that's kind of they're just about going over to steel armor, but there is still a fair amount of compound armor being used, which kind of still technically means they're ironclads to a certain degree. But anyway, um, up until this point, you had things most recently the Admiral Trafalgar and uh, uh, Victoria classes. They all had very low freeboard because they were using the old style turrets. So what was originally determined to be a turret, a, a big cylindrical armoured thing that contained some guns. With the Royal Sovereigns, they went for a much higher freeboard by using the barbette system. So they had an armoured barbette, but the guns kind of sat in an open topped barbette. And the first Sea Lord wasn't necessarily a massive fan of this, and so the last of the class was essentially a royal sovereign, but built with the old school, what I tend to call the biscuit tin turrets. And as a result of the massive weight imposed by these, the freeboard had to come down quite considerably to stop the thing rolling over, and even the secondary battery had to be essentially stripped of almost all its protection because of the sheer amount of weight that was involved. And this was one of the major weaknesses of the old school turret system, certainly in the period where compound armor, etc., is still around, because you're talking the era of belts, which were 16, 18, 20 plus inches thick, so huge masses. And the thing you've got to remember, again, is that just because it's an inferior material, as armor protection compared to Harvey steel or Krupp steel, iron armor or compound armor doesn't actually weigh any less. So an 18 inch thick belt of compound armor might only afford the same protection as arbitrarily, let's say a 10 or 12 inch belt of Harvey steel. The exact conversion is slightly different, but we're using arbitrary figures just to make the point. But they are almost the same material, which means their overall density is pretty much almost the same, which means that that inferior thickness, that inferior protection on a thicker belt is actually going to weigh pretty much the same as if you'd made an 18-inch belt out of Harvey steel, hence the overall weight is heavier for the similar level of protection. And with the old school turrets, in large part for balance reasons, which we mentioned in a previous question, they tended to be 
either uniform thickness or near uniform thickness all the way around. So when you've got you know the high teens thickness of steel running all the way around that biscuit tin, that thing weighs a colossal amount. And that means that it has to be lower down in the ship, otherwise it's going to cause you massive stability problems. And the Royal Navy essentially built it to kind of prove a point, both to the First Sea Lord and to people in general, that the age of the turret ship had passed, which was pretty much true. I mean, Hood looks good, but she was about six foot lower on the freeboard, which made her sea keeping atrocious compared to the Royal Sovereigns. And so she spent most of her career in the Mediterranean. And after that, the Royal Navy only built barbette ships because, as I've said several times before in previous dry docks, what you later see in sort of starting with the Majestics and so forth going forward are not turrets in the original sense of the word. They are barbettes enclosed by armoured gun houses, but which later adopted the nomenclature of turret. And with those, you can do rather useful things like only have the big thickness of armour on the front plate. Glauber Glausger asks, what ships could we rebuild with both historically accurate interiors and exteriors, both using memories and artist impressions as well as historical blueprints and records? I'd assume modern ships could be completed fairly well, Richelieu, Jean Bar, Vanguard, etc. But what about others, excluding museum ships? In terms of actually going down this path, we're kind of in luck because most ships, not all, but most ships from about the ironclad era onwards, we do have surviving plans for in various states of completeness. Obviously, there are some rather specific limitations like the Yamatos um, and some other ships, especially Japanese ships, but occasionally German ships and so forth, and the occasional British ship as well, where plans have been destroyed deliberately or accidentally. But for the most part, I would say 95% of warships that have been built, the plans exist somewhere. And as long as we've got a relatively decent set of them, they tend to be very comprehensive, which would mean that rebuilding them interior and exterior would be fairly doable. With one big caveat, and this is a caveat that this is something that Ryan on Battleship New Jersey's channel has mentioned in one of his videos. In fact, a, a video which I wouldn't necessarily necessarily say I helped with, but a video which I was familiar with before it came out. Because while I was on New Jersey earlier this year, we actually looked at the plan um, and tried to work out what it was showing that he would then show in that video. And the point he was making in that video is that. Just because it's what's on the plan doesn't necessarily mean that's what's actually implemented on the ship. And even if it is implemented on the ship, that doesn't mean it's not going to be changed during the ship's service life. So, you know, we could take the plans and we could go, OK, we're going to build the ship and this is what the plan says. So this is what we're going to build. But then if we got in a time machine and popped back to the ship in its service career, we might find that a lot of the interior layout is very subtly different from what we've built because things change either as I said during its active service life or just during build people go well the spirit of the plans is this but to be honest we're gonna we're gonna get it to do the, the function but I'm not necessarily going to follow this plan entirely and uh, actually while I was down giving people a tour of Portsmouth uh, one of the guys who was on the tour was um a chap who volunteers on HMS Belfast, and he pointed out HMS Belfast is in pretty much the same boat in that you've got all the diagrams from the 1955 onwards refit that theoretically made her NBC sealed and put her in the state that she's in today. And there's all sorts of wiring diagrams, piping diagrams, ventilation diagrams, and they don't really have a huge amount of relation to what's actually there on the ship other than perhaps, you know, this ventilation duct is supposed to start here and end here. And if you're lucky, that will actually be the case. But the route that it follows may be completely different. So yeah, with that caveat, most of those modern ships could be rebuilt. And 
And the thing is, obviously, as you go further and further back into the Age of Sail and so forth, the fewer and fewer plans tend to survive, and sometimes the less and less detailed the surviving plans are. The flip side to that is that those ships tend to be slightly simpler, and therefore it's easier to interpolate and fill in the gaps to create you know, what you need to do, because you know, it, if you've got the basic framing layout for a ship of the line, you can look at some of the existing ones, like Victory, or if you're building a frigate, various surviving frigates, and you can work out, okay, well, if this is how they were building this ship of the line, so let's say, for example, again, arbitrarily, let's say we don't have the plans for Collingwood's Royal Sovereign. Uh, we actually do have some plans for it, but let's say that we didn't. Let's say we only had some very basic models, paintings, maybe an outside line diagram. Well, we know when Royal Sovereign was built. We have HMS Victory. We can look at HMS Victory and go, well, this is roughly how they were building ships of the line at the time. We can build a ship to the shape, size, dimensions, etc. of Royal Sovereign. And if we use either exactly or similar building techniques and framing layouts, etc. to Victory, then what we have built as Royal Sovereign will probably be pretty close to the mark. Um, it's not going to be 100%, obviously, especially in the case of ship first rates, which tend to be artisan pieces for the most part. But you'd be surprised how far back we can go. I mean, you know, even using examples of wrecks and everything, they've even managed to get things like triremes, like the Olympias down in Greece done. But the further back you go, the more and more it becomes a, we're probably 90, 95% sure this is roughly what it would have been like, and less this is exactly what it would have been like. Ghost of Cicero asks, why did warships have portholes in the hull, and why do they disappear in later designs? Originally, it's because as you move from broadside battery vessels to centre battery and then turret vessels, you start to have problems with ventilation and light. Uh, now, obviously, even on a broadside vessel, you still need some interior light, especially in storms when you've had to close up the gun ports. But broadly speaking, an old school ship of the line or even a broadside ironclad, which will have lots of piercings in the hull for the guns and also a number of fairly large hatchways to allow guns to be brought up and down from the deck. They have a certain degree of natural ventilation going and a certain amount of light coming in. The problem is that as you take that away, you now have you know no gun ports along most of the side of your ship, or no gun ports at all in the case of turreted vessels. And the ships are also getting larger, which means that instead of, say, having a, a complete width-to-width -width gun deck, you might have multiple compartments. Now, ventilating and getting light into all those compartments becomes a much trickier issue. And one of the easiest ways to solve that is to basically recreate holes in the side of the hull, because that means that if you are providing light, which you will still need to do, whether that be by oil lamp or later by electricity, you don't need to provide as much of it, and you don't need to worry quite so much about ventilation either, because you can open a porthole. However, as time goes on, ships get more and more artificial ventilation and air conditioning systems. And of course, ships' power generation goes up and up. So the amount of electrical power that's needed to provide lighting for the ship becomes proportionally a small amount of the ship's total power output. And of course, portholes are a weakness in the side of the hull. Uh, one of the ways you can actually tell where the armor belt of a ship is is to look for where portholes aren't on a lot of World War I and World War II era vessels. But in times of war, they'd either be completely plated over, in the case of a lot of British ships, or in the case of a lot of World War II era US ships, you'd have uh, r plates, essentially shutters, if you like, which you could close over them, uh, which could then be opened when you weren't in action, whereas for a lot of Royal Navy ships, it was a case of, well, we're in war, guess what? The 
everything's been plated up. Uh, so again, if you go on HMS Belfast, you'll see that in one of the things they did in her post-war refits was replace that with a system of shutters, essentially, that could be open and closed depending on whether the ship was in action or not. And that's slightly beside the point, but anyway, the issue is that even if your hull plating is only half an inch or an inch thick, a glass porthole is still significantly weaker than that, so you don't want that if you can avoid it, and especially once you get into the post-World War II environment, so you're talking about potentially having to make the ship proof against radioactive fallout and biological or chemical warfare, obviously easily broken glass, rubber seals, all of this kind of stuff is an even bigger weakness, and so combine that with the amount of electrical power increasing and the amount of ventilation systems that are increasing, you start to see this stepping away from portholes to just clean flush holes. And to a certain degree, you can actually track, especially when it comes to ventilation and air conditioning, you can actually track how quickly these things are implemented in various fleets by when their ships start to lose their portholes. So for example, you look at a Baltimore class cruiser, wartime build cruisers of the US Navy for World War II, and they're pretty much without portholes almost from the get-go. Um, whereas you look at a Crown Colony class for the Royal Navy, built around about the same time, but when you look at immediate post-war images of them, they, whilst they have a reduced number of portholes compared to some of the pre-war cruisers, they still do have a fair number of them. Yakuzka Girls Marine High School training vessel Harakaze asks, I always thought the last remaining Imperial Japanese Navy vessel around was Mikasa. However, I recently came upon the former Japanese Navy ship Soya, which served in World War II, afterwards as a repatriation vessel, and then it went into the self-defense forces until 1978. Given she was built in the period that the channel covers, can you tell me some more? She appears to be a museum vessel today, and possibly the last Japanese Navy vessel afloat. I mean, personally, I'd be slightly hesitant to call the Soya a Japanese Navy vessel, considering that she was, well, okay, she was built by the Russians as part payment for Japanese construction efforts. That ne isn't necessarily a restriction on her being a Japanese Navy vessel. There, after the Battle of Tsushima, for example, were a fair number of Russian-built vessels that ended up in Japanese service through slightly more violent means. But when she was built, she was built as a cargo vessel with strengthening to allow her to operate in icy conditions, and she was delivered to a commercial shipping company. She was then brought into Japanese naval service as a supply ship during, well, actually just before Japan entered the Second World War um, in the run-up to it, and she served in that role pretty much through most of the war, um, occasionally with vague armoured merchant cruiser escorty type duties going on as well. And then post-war, obviously, as you mentioned, being used as a repatriation vessel. And then post-war after that, bouncing back and forth between being a Japanese Coast Guard vessel and an Antarctic research vessel. So she spent the vast majority of her time in civilian life. Um, obviously, as you said, she's now a museum, but uh, as I said, to describe her as a Japanese Navy vessel, I think is a, not necessarily accurate. She was built as a civilian vessel. She operated as a civilian vessel both before and after World War II, and she wasn't brought into the Japanese Navy and converted into any kind of frontline combat vessel. So, you know, to, to say that she is a Japanese vessel, Navy vessel, the last Japanese Navy vessel afloat. It, it would kind of like be calling the uh, Queen Mary down in California, uh, you know, the uh, a Royal Navy vessel, because well, she was built as a civilian vessel in the 1930s. She was brought into military service as a transport in World War Two, and then went back into commercial service. Uh, or non-direct military service, pretty much the same as Sawyer did. Sam Signorelli asks, What five historical naval figures would you like to see have a roundtable discussion with each other? Admiral Yi, Nelson, Ernest Evans, Beatty, if only for everyone else to beat on him, etc. Actually, just to see the sparks fly, 
I would probably want to get together some of the most aggressive captains and admirals of the past and see what would happen. So, as you can see, Lord Cochrane, obvious in auto include, um, Admiral Magon from the French Navy at Trafalgar, Captain de la Cerda of the Glorioso, who, you know, despite being a treasure ship, pretty much always chose to fight. Nelson, because, well, yeah, he's also fairly aggressive. And stick Halsey in there as well. So, yeah, Magon, de la Cerda, Nelson, Cochrane, and Halsey. Five incredibly aggressive officers uh, in the, their prosecution of the enemy and see what their various discussions turn out like. And to be honest, there's quite a few others you could quite easily substitute in. You know, Warburton, Lee, and Vian from the Royal Navy, um, Infernay from the Marine Nationale, to be honest, even Gravina from Trafalgar. You know, he knew a lot more about what he was doing and was prepared to fight it out a lot more than Villeneuve did. And of course, Admiral Yi, uh, again, very aggressive, but perhaps a little bit more given to long-term planning than some of the others. Iboreg asks, It's no real secret that from the time of the self-propelled torpedo until the proliferation of radar, destroyers had a tendency to be captained by people who were somewhat lacking in self-preservation instincts. What are some of your favourite crazy destroyer captains? There are so, so many ridiculously aggressive destroyer captains. It's, it's almost impossible to even pick a short list. I mean, there's the obvious ones, like you mentioned, Captain Ernest Evans. There's, you know, Philip Vian, who led the, the last sword-equipped boarding action in the Royal Navy. Uh, you could pick any one of the captains of 10th Destroyer Flotilla. You know, that's got Piron Bliskovich, uh, uh, Haida, Athabaskan, etc. in it. You know, I like to describe 10th Destroyer Flotilla as uh, the asylum for mad destroyer captains that the Royal Navy established in the middle of the Second World War, because essentially, as long as you keep them boxed up tight enough and then point them roughly in the direction of the enemy, they're sure to accomplish something quite remarkable. And then, you obviously, know, in the US Navy, you've got Ali Burke. In the Royal Navy, there's loads. There's uh, Captain Trelawney of the Spitfire at Jutland, Warburton Lee, obviously, in the in Narvik, uh, Roop in Glowworm uh, off of Norway, Hank of USS Laffey, the first one that took on here at point blank range. You know, the list could go on and on. Flying Finn 1956 asks, The welds on Liberty ships occasionally didn't hold up in the colder northern waters, losing an entire ship to what we now call brittle fracture. How long did it take the US Navy and or shipbuilders to figure this out and correct it? Oh, engineering materials. Shockingly, I like these kind of questions. Uh, now, it was a little bit of a difficult thing to completely correct, because as with so many things, shipbuilding involves compromise, especially when you're trying to mass manufacture cargo ships as quickly as you hum is humanly possible. The problem was relatively quickly identified, as in, you know, it was identified within a year or so of the problem first being drawn to everybody's attention. And when I say a year, that's kind of a year from someone sitting down at a desk going, ah, we have a problem with Liberty ships breaking apart when they shouldn't be, to finding someone to fix the problem to that person, then discovering exactly what the issue was, and then devising a way to test for that, and then a way for that test to be distributed throughout all the various shipbuilders, and of course, mitigation measures for ships that had already been built, and corrective measures for ships that were being built or to be built. But of course, there were multiple factors involved, and brittle ductile transition was known as a thing all the way back in the 1840s, 1850s, when they were first looking at iron hulls, not even armoured hulls, but just iron hulls, and they discovered, as I've mentioned in previous dry docks, that a ship, say, in shallow Chinese waters or a set of armour tested on land would have a ductile failure when it was hit by cannon fire, whereas a ship in colder waters would have a shattering effect on the iron, i.e. a brittle failure. So exactly what the issue was 
wasn't that difficult to figure out in the in the first place. It was then why was the sh- the Liberty ship suffering brittle ductile failures? Because although obviously being all welded, that was you know part of the problem, but there were a lot of other ships present at the time that also had significant amounts of welding in them and didn't have random cruisers breaking apart at sea. Um, so part of it was because the Liberty ships were mass being mass manufactured and sections were being made off site. One of the big trade offs was the type of steel they were made of. And steel obviously is iron and carbon. But if you want to make different types of steel with different properties, you introduce other smaller amounts of trace elements. So you can introduce nickel if you're making uh, armor. You introduce molybdenum if you're making really, really like top notch face hardened armor and so on and so forth. And there are two things that can end up in steel, either accidentally or deliberately, that make it particularly corrosion resistant, that being sulfur and phosphorus. The problem is both sulfur and phosphorus end up making the steel much more brittle in the kind of temperature zones that we're talking about, like the Arctic which isn't good. Basically, it moves the brittle ductile transition point disturbingly high. But you also have to factor into it that, you know, these things are being welded by people who are not necessarily the absolute best trained, and they're operating on something of a deadline. And there's also not the level of testing available prior to this issue being fixed that either would be available after or indeed is available today with you know, portable radiography equipment. And on top of all that was issues, again, in the interests of speed with the ships being built with a, a fair number of right angle square joints, um, whether that be portholes, doorways, hatchways, bits of the hull, etc., plates, etc., all of which are known to cause stress points which can exacerbate the issue and normally wouldn't be done. I mean, you could even see with this one that has failed, you can see that the side of the hull actually rises in a curve at the superstructure and at the back, and that's intentional. So it wasn't just a matter of working out, as I said, what had happened, this brittle failure of the ship, but it was also a matter of determining what had caused the stresses to build up to cause it, why the material and the weld was more susceptible to it, and all sorts of other things. I mean, quite another issue, which again, those of you who do large-scale welding will know about these days, is was just the fact that if you heat up a large quantity of metal because you're doing a big welding job in this kind of environment in a shipyard or something, you are heating at the metal, and then if you're moving on pretty quickly, you're letting it cool relatively quickly. Okay, you're not cooling it quite as quickly as you would in an armor foundry, but you're taking a metal that, you know, corrosion resistant hull metal that's already got a relatively high brittle ductile transition point, and you're heating it up quickly and then cooling it fairly quickly, which is going to cause that material to become even harder, even more brittle, which is going to be a bit of a problem for stress, cracks, etc., etc. Patrick Donnelly asks, What are your thoughts on Admiral Spruance's decision to lead a surface force, including the battleships Iowa and New Jersey, during Operation Hailstone? Personally, I tend to categorise it under might as well. So for those of you who are unaware, Operation Hailstone was a big U.S. Navy attack on the Japanese fortress lagoon of Truk, formerly a big naval base. Now, Truk was not exactly massively well defended and also, to be honest, is a little bit difficult to defend generally. The Japanese Navy pretty much recognised that. Truck had been effectively bypassed by most of the US Navy advance, and its days as an anchorage for the majority of the Japanese fleet had ended a little while ago, as had indeed the days of the majority of the Japanese fleet. But what some of what was left was still there, mostly transport ships and a few small warships. Hailstone began with massed airstrikes, and then a small group of warships and auxiliary cruisers and so forth decided we're going to make a run for it. They were attacked by American air groups, but then 
Spruance decided he was going to take Iowa, New Jersey, some cruisers and some destroyers in for a, a gun action, which some people have criticized. But the thing is, ultimately, when you look at a naval action, what's being risked? What's the potential gain to the enemy, etc.? Was there a real risk of Spruance's ships being sunk? Not really. Uh, most, if not all, of the aircraft that the Japanese had on truck were damaged or destroyed by this point, so there wasn't going to be any significant Japanese aerial action, and what few aircraft there were still around, you know, the anti-aircraft guns of uh, two Iowa-class battleships plus escorts were more than capable of handling. Were there any submarines around? Probably not, and even if they were, warships going at 30 plus knots are some of the hardest targets to engage. So the statistical chance of running into subs are very low and they probably couldn't hit them anyway. So, okay. Japanese surface warships being a danger. Well, those are the things they're going to engage. You're talking about a couple of battleships against the biggest thing, which is a small light cruiser. The only real danger there, I suppose, would be perhaps... One or two of the Japanese destroyers, of course, would still have torpedoes. And uh, indeed, during the engagement, torpedoes were launched. And of course, long lances are pretty long range. So you could argue that there was some greater risk to American ships, as opposed to if they just used airstrikes, because there's a outside chance that one of the Iowas could have been hit by a long lance or several. But on balance, you know, they probably would have had more than enough warning. And at the ranges that were being engaged, the odds of a a handful of long lances actually coming close to hitting are relatively slim, especially when you look at you know, how many long lances were launched to get how many hits at something like Java Sea. So broadly speaking, the risk to the US Navy's surface assets was pretty negligible. Would the destruction of these particular Japanese ships by air or by sea make a huge difference? Which form they were destroyed by? Not really. If one or two of them manage to escape, is it going to affect the outcome of the war? Again, they're relatively small ships. Even at the beginning of the war, their effect would have been negligible by this stage. You know, whether or not Japan gets a single destroyer back from truck or not, or a single small cruiser, is not going to make the blindest bit of difference to the overall fate of the Japanese Empire. So I think we can scratch that off the list. At which point, you know, you might as well. You've got these big battleships. You've spent hundreds of millions of dollars on them by this point in between construction, maintenance, outfitting, etc. You've got them there. to Their purpose is to shoot things. There's some targets for them to shoot. Might as well go shoot the things that are moving. I mean, it's not exactly like truck was poor in other targets for the aircraft to go after. Brian Stevens asks... I do look forward to the legacy robot voice at the end of each 5-Minute Guide episode, as it reminds me of Patrick McNee. However, I've never been quite sure I understood what it says. Don't forget to comment on the pinked post for dry dock questions. Is this a garbled version of pinned, or is it some British expression which I'm unfamiliar with? No, it just says comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions. There's no particular Britishism about it. It's just the text-to-speech synthesizer messed up up the pronunciation very slightly um but to some ears which to be honest is one of the reasons i ditched it because ba it was all right at basic words but uh the further and further down the line you got we're trying to get more complicated words you know compared to today's uh ai text-to-speech stuff it really was very very limited i mean even today AI um, text-to-speech still gets some things wrong, especially when you have words that can be pronounced multiple different ways, and you need to know either within the same language or a different language how they're pronounced. Because, for example, if you're talking about the Battle of the Nile, an English text-to-speech AI would probably call the French flag flagship Orient, because that's how you say the word in English, but of course in French it's Orient. And if you are using a text to speech in that kind of circumstance, it's going to be very obvious very quickly because it's going to pronounce it 
English phonetically for the most part. And that's before you get into the slightly more complicated um, French names in that particular battle. One of these days I'll just have to tell you how much effort it took to get that old school voice text to speech thing to pronounce the word Chicago instead of Chicago, which is apparently how it decided it was actually pronounced. But nonetheless, yeah, it's just pin post. And finally, Cisco fan asks, can you briefly detail Marine B-25 PBJ missions versus Japan and did the reputation that the Japanese hated these planes more than any others hold true? This all started with a rather complex series of events based in the production of the B-29 Super Fortress and of switching around of the, if you like, ownership of various plants that you know were going to produce various aircraft for the different services. The US Army Air Forces wanted a certain plant for production of B-29s, which was currently producing stuff for the Navy. And in all the administrative detailing that sort of it was exchanging various bits and pieces, one of the things that got transferred was a bunch of B-25 bombers. Of course, <laughs> Hornet attacking Japan at the beginning of uh, the Pacific campaign aside, the Navy itself didn't have a tremendous amount of use for a twin-engine medium bomber, so the Marines got them. And the Marines promptly set about equipping them with as much firepower as they could humanly beg, borrow, or steal, and went after various Japanese shipping areas using a variety of low-level strike tactics. You know, bombs, rockets, lots of guns. As you can see here, there's been a fair few added to the uh, front of this particular aircraft. Unfortunately for everyone involved, PBJ does not stand for peanut butter and jelly, much as it is a very delicious snack. It stands for Patrol Bomber J, uh, which was the letter designating North American Aviation, thus following the World War II era US Navy aircraft designation system. And these would be amongst the aircraft that would also do skip bombing, for example. Now, as for the Japanese hating these planes more than any others, I don't necessarily know if that's true. I mean, if I was a Japanese sailor, I can think of a few things I might hit hate more than marauding B-25s at the twilight of the Pacific campaign. Massed airstrikes by Dauntless Dive Bombers, for example, might rank a little bit higher up my list. However, there is also the fact that strikes from dive bombers tend to be far away, far away, far away. Oh, dive bomber! Far away, far away, far away. And then there's fire and explosions and everything. And even strikes from things like Avengers tend to be, ah, there's a torpedo bomber coming after us. And it's dropped its torpedo and it's going away. And now we have to deal with the torpedo. Whereas the B-25, as well as being a larger aircraft, tends to be, ah, there's a low level aircraft coming in. Oh, it's very big. Oh, it's very angry. That's an awful lot of machine gun fire. Let's find somewhere to duck. And he's still flying straight for us. Oh, yes. And of course, there's bombs. And of course, there's rockets. Because of course, there is. Because somebody loaded this aircraft with far too many explosives. And they're kindly donating them to us. At which point, for the average sailor on deck. Yeah, I have a feeling being attacked by a very angry PBJ would probably be a lot more traumatic than being attacked by a dive bomber or a torpedo bomber or several. Uh, and of course, you know, when these things are going hell for leather straight down the throats of the remaining ships of the Japanese Empire, they're also going to be getting a lot more up close and personal with what passes for Japanese anti-aircraft fire, which probably is going to exacerbate the idea that Perhaps the Japanese hate them more than everybody else because they're going to get a very, very, very close up view of everything from, you know, 100 millimeter, five inch, three inch, got heavy AA all the way down to probably a few angry people with Arasakas and a few suicidal people with Nanbus taking pot shots at them. So, yeah, on an individual level, probably not exactly the most, the favorite experience of a Japanese sailor. 
were also not necessarily the most common one either because of their relatively late entry into the war. And that concludes this week's episode of The Dry Dock. Thank you very much, everybody, for listening. Um, just in case you may have missed it, which, to be fair, you might have, um, with the last Fun Friday, I pointed out that if you happen to be in the UK or you're going to be in the UK at some point in the early part of next year, there is on the relevant page uh, meeting drack on drickinfl.co.uk, link in the description below, there is a sort of email-based poll going on where you can express your preference as to whether the next tour that I organise is going to be at Portsmouth, Chatham or HMS Belfast. And then, of course, based on that, I may make a decision as to how many and where we're going to do the next tour or two and you know when it's going to be uh, and all this kind of stuff. And as I mentioned in that particular um, video as well at the beginning of uh, the Friday video on Austro-Hungarian firearms, um, there is also a possibility going forward that I will work with uh, several other his history-based YouTubers to offer a slightly more organized and formalized system of tours to various places of historical interest around the UK, uh, because obviously you know, ships are my thing. Um, but I also, through my medieval enactment, have a reasonable degree of knowledge about things like castles. So the Tower of London potentially is on the list there. Um, but not being a specialist in that subject, if I was to, get, say, get a medieval weapon specialist to come along as well, or they led the door and I supplemented it, that expands the range of things that we could look at. And who knows, depending on how many people want to come on board with that, various other items of historical significance could be on there as well. I mean, Fort Nelson's a really good one as well. That's on land just near Portsmouth, but it's got a lot of naval guns on it. Nonetheless, with all that said, thank you very much for listening, and see you again in another video. Bye.